Hi guys, I am tuning in here to um, tell you a little story um, that I kind of been holding on to here. I did get to share it with um, a group uh, about probably maybe two months ago or so, but I wanted to share it and I really felt like God had said, um, said some things to me when I was running this race and I felt that he said that you need to to speak it and not just write it down. So I'm just going to share it with you, whoever wants to listen, and hopefully we'll have fun and see God, right? Okay. So I was up in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I was going to do the Erie Triathlon. And this was in like the beginning of August. And I didn't even commit to the race until about, I don't know, maybe four or five days before the race. Um, and so anyway, um, I'm just going to read a little quote from a book that I read called Ridiculous Faith, and then I'll tell you my story. So it says this, after we have established a foundation of faith by knowing God and engaging his promises, then we need to act. The fastest way out of a spiritual rut is to do something courageous for God. Something out of our normal comfort zone. Something that forces us to rely on God in faith. Nothing has exploded my faith more than seeing God work out impossible situations. And yes, that is the first step into the unknown um, and can be terrifying. I definitely know what it's like to be frozen in fear and doubt and worry before I take the leap. But I've learned to keep telling myself that God has this because he does. And that was Celine Bryan's words from the book Ridiculous Faith. It was a good little book. And I, I just thought that was a little nugget. And it pertains to kind of like the things that I saw in this, in this race when I was running it. So it was early morning on a hot day in August when I arrived at a beach on Presque Isle in Erie, Pennsylvania. I stood watching the waves. I was really just standing there like fearful, fearfully intimidated. Um, I wasn't sure about the swim. I hadn't been training on swimming and I had swam a lot in the past in, in races and things, but I just didn't feel prepared and I probably wasn't prepared. Um, and the waves and the wind was kind of crazy. And so I was just like, I don't know about this. So, but I was like the last registrant of the race altogether. So I watched for a while wondering whether I could really make it through the swim, but I kind of like convinced myself, oh, there's lifeguards out there, lots of them. So, you know, they'll, they'll catch me, right? <laughs> they'll get me. So I found my way over to the race check-in area. And I was like the first one in line because I was really early because I was really nervous. And um, there was only one guy standing behind me waiting to get his packet. So we were both kind of waiting for like the people to get everything set up. So finally, uh, they asked my name and I gave my name. And then they asked competitor number two for his name. And victory he said his last name was victory and so i was just like victory uh, i thought to myself well that's a that's a good thing you know victory is standing right behind me and um i just kind of took that with me because i was nervous and because i was afraid so here's my account of how i saw god uh, show himself that day so uh, like i said i was in initially intimidated by this swim there were three different colored swim caps. Um, it was orange, green, and yellow. And then there were white caps. And you could wear the white cap if you were like afraid or if you thought like, I want the lifeguards to really be paying attention to me because I'm a little bit nervous. You could wear this white cap. So I was originally in the green group, but I ended up uh, humbling myself and wearing the white cap because I was nervous. So when they did end up, um, they did end up shortening the swim because of the condition so it wasn't just me like i wasn't just being crazy um it, it was kind of bad out there right so as the first group began they saw that it was like pretty shallow water pretty far out like the first buoy where you had to turn to start swimming along the shoreline um it was pretty much shallow all the way out to that buoy and then you had to really start swimming so as i as I watched these people go out, the first wave, the orange wave, they were walking <laughs> instead of swimming, like pretty far out there. 
and the waves were really intimidating. So the temptation was to just keep your feet planted right where they are and just walk instead of diving on in and getting getting going on your on your swim. And so I saw this start to happen with the first wave um, and something inside me, and I was equally scared, probably way more scared than a lot of those people who were walking. But something inside of me just rose up and said, this is a swim. <laughs> this is not a walk. I am going to swim. I will not walk. I don't care. It just, it's not for me. So I'm not going to walk when I ought to be swimming on this course. Just no, that's not going to happen. It's not what I signed up for, right? So I get out there, and I'm very tempted, though, to copy those water walkers. Um, because I know, um, it, you know, you, you start to swim, and then you, like, start to panic. So I'm like, oh, I could just walk, and I'll be, go I'll be good, I'll be better, get used to the water. But I was like, I would not let myself do that. I'm like, I have to swim. It's a swim. It's not a walk. And, you know, also because I know a water walker, I know Jesus, he walked on water and he said he would wrap his arms around me and he would go with me no matter where I was. And so I dug down deep. I know it sounds corny and silly because it's just a little swimming race, but for me, it really was intimidating. I'm like, I could drown, you know, I don't know. So, but that voice inside was just like, just go. Jesus is with you. This is a swim. This is not a walk. You signed up to swim. So you dive in and you go. And so I started to swim with all the work and worry an almost 40-year-old overweight woman possibly could muster. So that's what I did. And why? Why was that voice inside me so um, insistent that I should not walk? Because only shallow people walk when they signed up to swim, right? You have to be in shallow water if you're going to walk when you're supposed to be swimming. And I don't want to be a person who stays in shallow water. That's not what a Christian is supposed to be. As Christians, we have most certainly 100% signed up to swim. So if you're walking, stop that. I know the waves are scary, but you got to start swimming. He will save you. He has saved you. So trust. So away we went, and many people around me began to raise their fearful hands for the lifeguards to come and get them, because the lifeguards are out there on, like, kayaks and stuff, and little boats. So many people, and you were allowed to, like, rest yourself on, like, the boats or the kayaks if you needed to. That was legal. I didn't do that. I just kept going, because I knew that if I wanted to finish and get out of this mess, I had to continue on as quickly as humanly possible. So about three-fourths of the way through the swim, people began to veer off the swim route in front of me. We had been instructed to keep the buoys to our right and just swim with the shoreline until we saw the last one where we would turn back in and go to the finish. So, but I'm swimming, we're only about three-fourths of the way down, and I can't even see the final buoy, so I know that I'm not there yet. And a whole group of people who had just previously been in front of me, because I'm not the fastest swimmer, um, started to veer off and just go uh, swim toward the finish. Um, they took a right, right? <laughs> and um, I was just like, where are they going? Like the second buoy or the last buoy is not even visible yet. Like what is happening? What did they, did they cancel the race now? Because I knew they shortened the swim. So I'm like, well, maybe it got worse and maybe something. Like I was so confused. Like where are these people going? And um, the truth is, um, as I found out later, is that they were going the wrong way. That's where they were going. Um, they made a mistake. They made a wrong turn, and they all just followed each other going the wrong way. Like, okay. So, you know, what I saw in that, too, is just, like, the swim that we signed up for is not only scary sometimes and terrifyingly intimidating, but it can also be quite confusing. Some of those closest to us, very closest people to us, are going to cross the finish line and swim the complete wrong way. They're going to try to start swimming toward the finish line far too soon because they're incredibly uncomfortable or tired or weary or weak. And they're going to get a DNF, which means, in race jargon, did not finish. 
They want to get to the finish line faster, so they take a detour, they take a shortcut, and it doesn't get you there. It'll get you there, but it won't get you there with, um, you know, with 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 a medal. You're not going to win the prize that way because you're going to get a did not finish because you went the wrong way and you shortened it when you di you didn't do the whole race. So you're quitting basically. You can't finish well if you cut corners and you're scared. Because guess what? I was scared too. <laughs> I wanted to quit too. I wanted to be finished before the finish line presented itself too. But I wasn't about to waste the tumultuous effort it took me to get where I was. I knew that if I did that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say that I actually completed this race. If I was going to do that, if I had any intention or any inclination to do that whatsoever, I would have just slept in that morning and said, oh, I paid for the race, but I don't care. I'm just not going to go because why put forth the effort if you're just going to quit when it gets difficult? You already know it's going to be difficult before you start. So you got to just go. You got to go and keep going. If we want to finish this race well, this Christian life, we have to keep swimming even when those closest to us veer off, park outside the camp, and even completely quit on us. So just when I began to wonder if it was me who was really going the wrong way, even though I knew better, having been given the clear instructions at the start, I saw a man come from behind me. He was wearing a yellow cap. And the yellow cap started like five minutes after my group. So I knew this man was like a really strong swimmer. He came from behind. I didn't even need the yellow cap to tell me that. He was swimming a straight line past me and everyone else in the water. He was really going. So I decided to try to keep him in my sights, in my peripheral vision, and just try to stay parallel with him. And he really stabilized me is what he did. He was safe because he was strong. And when he got ahead, I set my sights ahead and followed him as steadily as I could. And, you know, I just wanted to say that I am I am here in, in a, well, I, I'm, I'm here in the Christian life and in the church because several incredibly strong people stabilized me and made me feel safe for a time. I don't know if that time's over, but but they did. So, you know, set your sights on someone like that. Find someone who's strong. Follow them steadily as you can because there is no doubt that those guys are following Christ faithfully, right? You just got to you gotta set your sights on someone, uh, namely Jesus, but God works through people and he gives us examples and, and helps us to see himself in others. So we're finally nearing the turn toward the finish. And as I rounded the second buoy, I felt my whole body um, begin like being taken by the wave, like up and down and it crashed down on me and I kept looking back like oh no another one's coming and they just kept coming and I I was just like I can't just look at the waves I can't turn around I have to just swim so I wised up and I began booking it back to the finish and as I swam I was being bounced up and down by the rhythm and I felt motion sickness I really did and I couldn't believe I was seasick while I was swimming I had never experienced that before but it was really odd but I dared not look back again because I knew, I just knew the waves would just keep crushing me. So when the waves of trial and trauma come upon us, sometimes, especially as it's been in my life, they just keep coming. One trauma after another, and the next thing you know, you're six years older and facing the wrong way on the road, which was meant to get you to the finish line. You're watching in fear and waiting for the next crushing blow, knowing it's coming, but paralyzed by the fear that forfeits the finish line for a false sense of control. So my advice is, like, don't watch the waves. Like, I like I tried that before, and it doesn't work. We all go through lots of wildernesses in this world, and when the waves just keep coming, and come they will, you just keep going. You just keep going, and you don't look back. You finish. And it's closer than you think, really. And you have to just try to remember and hold on like I did to the fact that when you started this race, victory was standing right behind you. And our victory has already won. We've already been given the victory through Christ. And so we need to think victory. We're going to win. We're going to get there. 
So I get on the bike. I was, I was victorious because I was like, I, I finished the swim, right? And I was happy about that. So I mounted up on my bike and I felt victory. And um, I actually finished the swim without doom and death swallowing me the way I was certain that they would. And so the bike course was completely flat, not like most of the races that I've done around my way, which are steep mountain hills and climbing on the bike all the time. And, but Lake Erie, the island there is, is very flat. So my temptation in the bicycle race was just to coast rather than stride. Um, but just because we're in an easy season doesn't mean we get to coast. No one gets a pass to coast. It's pedal down, fully engaged, ever and always in the Christian life. And I'm going to tell you a story, too, about coasting. So the day before the race, my girls talked me into renting this six-person buggy bike. I have no idea what to call this thing. But the four of us pedaled, and the baby sat in the front. And it was quite easy at first, actually. The girls were in the back pushing me from behind, and I barely had to pedal at all. I was being propelled by the excitement of preteens, enamored with the ridiculousness of this contraption, right? So it was six mile out and back. Surely we could ride that in the allotted hour my $6 million payment had purchased. But surely not. It didn't happen. Just before the halfway mark, the behind me bikers gave up the ghost and barely biked at all. I felt as though I was pedaling all alone, all the way back. I had to keep reminding them to pull their weight. They were tired. They were complaining. And the baby was singing her ABCs as if not on the verge of needing a, I wasn't on the verge of needing a quadruple bypass on the night before my triathlon, right? So I want you to think about this. The leaders that are among us um, in, in, in the church and in the faith are usually pretty strong. God has called and equipped them and anointed them with his most mighty strength and power. But our leaders are human beings. If anyone is guilty of failing to recognize the, na the need to pull uh, my own weight and stop relying heavily on them and their prayers and their time and their help and their efforts, it's me. But there are essentially three types of people, maybe more, but this is what I saw with our little bicycle exercise. Some of us are tired, like my girls behind me were tired. They're weary from years of trauma and trials and maybe long, no longer trusting as truly or seeing any reason to have strong faith and hope. The weary are hard to carry. If you're tired or weary like I was when I got, uh, when I got here, I just want to encourage you to ask Christ for his power and his strength before you ask your leaders for theirs. His is far more effective and it saves theirs uh, when they're, for when they're needed. So some of us are complaining. Sometimes, you know, we get selfish and we expect the church to be capitalistic or consumer driven. And I've been this person before too, but these guys, if, if we're like this, you know, these guys won't bother anyone as long as everything's always suited to serve them and their needs above all. But if not, well, we'll all hear about it. Maybe they'll no longer be willing to serve if thus and so doesn't happen or if so and so is here. And when we complain, whether it's to one another or to our leaders, we have to rebuke and correct one another. Complainers weigh down the faithful and forfeit the blessings of many. Some of us are just sitting up front without any pedals, comfortably singing our ABCs. Some of us are just along for the ride like Sunny. These are the immature. And if you're new or you're newly converted to, the, to, to a church, that's fine. You're going to grow because... Hopefully, people are going to be discipling you. you know, everybody should be doing that. But I'm talking about perpetual babies who suck bottles of milk instead of real spiritual meat because they're unwilling to go deeper, happy to just stay seated and sing nursery rhymes with the scripture verse their phone provides them once a day. And this, while everyone else works to pull their dead weight around. If you're young in the faith, you have to make it your daily effort to grow in the Lord. Follow the strong. Watch your leaders. Invest in others. Serve someone, serve the church, visit the sick, love the broken, find someone to pray for. Study to show yourself approved. No one's going to spoon feed you forever. At least they shouldn't anyway. Children are meant to become personally responsible at some point. So make it your purpose to do so, so that your leaders don't have to pull your dead weight around as you live carefree and comfortable in the front seat, 
singing your baby songs. As far as my buggy bike ride, what started out as fun and exciting ended in pure work. God's work can be that way, not because we're unwilling, but because we are being overworked by the dead waiters. We have some super worthy workers in the church. I see them working hard in his strength, but when those around us are weary and selfish and immature, that dead weight wreaks havoc on even worthy workers. Do not do this to them. Burnout is real, and no matter how spiritual someone is, remember, we started this race with victory standing behind us. He already won. So to remember that victory is with us, right? And then, of course, we come to the run portion of the race. The run portion of the race is home to me. Running is my first love, and I've done more running than most people have done driving. So I set out on my run, and I was tempted to be the rascally rule breaker that I am and wear my headphones despite the strict forbidding of them during this race, right? I used to run upwards of 20 miles music-free, but these days, I'm basically, I'm going to sit down and cry and eventually curl up and die without my music to distract me when I'm running. That's my crutch, right? And then I'm thinking, well, are they really going to DNF me for wearing headphones? It's not, not like I'm going to win. I'm not going to place like old non-competitive ladies like me. They get away with stuff like this, right? But I thought to myself in, um, in my music temptation, this thought, the rules are the rules. And if I'm going to play the game, I have to play by the rules, or it isn't fair to everyone else. And I began to think, since I had no music to distract me, about how true that is in Christianity. And so, like I said, I tend to be a rule breaker. I hate legalism, and I spent enough years on that end of the extreme to know how unhelpful an empty rule following for the sake of itself really is. But liberty is not about rule breaking. It's about love. And love isn't selfish or unfair. Love doesn't just want its own way. So in all things, when we're called to a standard, whether by the word of God or by the authorities that we love and respect, the rules really are the rules, and we have to be okay with that or we'll become the perpetual thorns in a race full of more respectful runners. And so nothing really extremely exciting, exciting happened on the run during this particular race, and the only thing that was odd was bugs, right? Two bugs quite literally flew directly into my mouth while I was running. And it was really another object lesson for me. <laughs> and the lesson was this, keep your mouth shut. Really, just keep your mouth shut. Here I thought I was trying to breathe and prevent early onset hyperventilation, when in reality I was opening the gates of Hades and sending out a mating call for insects under the age of three who had not been formally baptized in this church of hellfire. <laughs> so, truly, this is the truth. The Bible says the tongue is a fire a world of wickedness set on fire by hell itself. He said it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Well, what is James trying to say there? He was trying to say, keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut when you're mad because we can hurt people with words, often without even meaning to. Keep your mouth shut when your emotions are out of whack. Keep your mouth shut when you're feeling mean or melancholy. Only speak what's edifying when the time is right. The pain we could prevent if we would just learn this it's not without reason that James tells us that he who tames the tongue has control of his whole body. So the last bug that I encountered was on my back. A runner came from behind me and swatted it off, but accidentally squished it on my shoulder instead. So she apologized for smearing bug guts and blood on me when she really just wanted to help me not get bitten by the bug. So she taught me something, though, in that, too. And it's this. Relationships are messy. Caring about the well-being of others is messy. We can get discouraged when we're really trying to help someone, and we both end up bloody, feeling like all our guts just got squished out. Give grace. We need so much grace, not because one of us is perfect, not one of us is perfect. And I want to believe, and I do believe, that we're all trying our best to, to love one another as imperfect as we all are. So give grace. Recognize your need for it and give it egregiously. As I came toward the finish with fatigue setting in and I remembered what I had learned about proper breathing in high school soccer so many years before, I came upon a cheerleader of sorts and she was just waving and shouting and making a fuss when I ran by and she was saying, good job, well done, you're a triathlete, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I guess I am, right? But I was kind of at my end too. 
And I just wanted to say that just don't ever forget what you learn at the beginning. Your foundation will carry you through a lifetime of full marathon running and triathlons, if we're comparing that to the Christian life, because that is what the Christian life is like. It's like a long distance, really difficult, all kinds of multi-sport event. It really is. And while you're remembering these basic basic breathing methods, right, that you've been taught or your foundations of faith that you need to get you to the finish, the other thing that you need to do is encourage. Encourage, encourage, encourage. No one ever says they want less encouragement, but, you know, I take that back because maybe there are some that don't appreciate my encouragement, but I can say that it, that, that I've given it in um, out of my heart, you know. But we always need more encouragement, don't we? So be that cheerleader, you know. Be them. I spent a lot of years not being a cheerleader. and I don't know. I, I feel like I've kind of grown and I, I kind of encourage people a lot more than I used to now. And so I, we just need to be cheerleaders for one another because you are a Christian, and you're going to finish, and we got to make it our goal, right? Because we started this victory, or that we started this race with victory standing behind us, and he already won. So we have to think victory, no matter what we go through, no, how, no matter how intimidating the waves are, no matter how much we think we can just coast along, or um, you know, no matter what happens no matter how high the hills are no matter how difficult things seem to get jesus already won so we just have to trust that and um yeah pray for me too that i would trust that whatever comes right so thanks for listening, and I hope that was helpful. And um, yeah, share share some of your stories with me. I'd like to hear them. <laughs> See you later.